So there is a great need in the country of Spain. Our family, uh, we went to, to Spain 22 years ago, along with the Johnsons, who you can see there in this picture with us. Um, we've been ministering together during all of this time. Uh, you can see our children here. Um, our son, Mark, he's the tallest one over there beside my, my wife. He's 16. And then our daughter is uh, 18. She just started Welsh College this fall. And then my wife, uh, she's there on that end over there. Uh, she's actually from Northern Virginia. We met at Welch College and uh, have been married for a long time now, it seems like. Uh, 24, 24 years uh, we've been married. And uh, so in, when we first went to the country of Spain, we were helping out uh, an established church that was established in the early 80s. And uh, so we were helping out there, but then uh, we felt like it was time for us to go and start a new church. So in 2006, our two families went and we began a new work in the city of Alterete. Now my dad, he's from Arkansas, and he says, son, I can't pronounce the name of that town. I'm just going to call it Apple Tree and God will know what I'm talking about. So if that's what you want to do, that's perfectly fine. Uh, the Alpedrete, the as we say, is a town of about 15,000 people and before 2006 never had had an evangelical church. And uh, the church is doing well now. Uh, of course, we've been uh, experiencing all the crisis now as well. Uh, here you can kind of see the inside of our sanctuary area uh, of our, our facility. We're also in like a storefront type facility. And uh, this particular day we took this picture our daughter was sharing about uh, e-team experience that she had when she went to Japan uh, that was uh, last summer in 2019 uh, but the our building hasn't looked our chairs and sanctuary area hasn't looked like that since March the 8th because we haven't been able to have in-person services since then um, things got somewhat better uh, in July and August and Spain is experiencing a second wave now uh, we're in the process of getting internet in our facility so we can begin doing at least some broadcasting and doing some things from the, our church building uh, to for our services and all but be praying with us about that situation as we work through all those details um, one of the exciting things always in ministry is uh, seeing people come to know Christ as their Savior and follow the Lord in baptism uh, these are uh, the last three people that we've baptized. Uh, we, we don't have a baptistry in our church. And so there's a family in our church who has a pool, an in-ground pool. And it's actually covered. So even if it's raining, we can go over there and we can have baptisms. Uh, so that's been really nice to be able to do. And it's always a, a great day when we have uh, the service, the baptismal service. And uh, let me tell you just a little bit about these three that were baptized in, uh, in 2019. Uh, Ruben, uh, he's over there on the bottom. He's one of the young men who's grown up as a kid in our church. And uh, he accepted Christ as a Savior uh, when he was a, a kid. And uh, at the, uh, about 16 years of age, he felt like he was ready to make that step, public confession uh, in baptism. And so he, uh, he was baptized on that day. And then we have also uh, another young lady in her early 20s who she was searching for the, for God, and uh, she remembered there was this guy in her high school who he was different, and he like believed in God, and he like he was he was intriguing to her, and so she tried to figure out how she could get in touch with him, and she was finally able to get in touch with him, and uh, she was talking with him, and and uh, his mom actually was doing some Bible studies with her. And she accepted Christ as her Savior. Well, her mother uh, began seeing the change in her daughter's life. And she accepted the Lord as her Savior. And we were able to baptize both mother and daughter on the same day. Uh, and it was such a wonderful experience. You can see uh, her mother there with her hands raised in the air. Uh, she was celebrating as uh, she come up out of the water. And... Uh, it's always great to see uh, these testimonies. Uh, and one of the things that she's told us, the mother has told us, is, uh, she's, she actually sings in a professional choir. And, and so she has taken her Bible to, to practices. And just a lot of times we just leave it sitting there 
and on a chair or on a, a what do you call these things music stands and um, invite people to come by and read it and if they have questions she loved to talk with them and so it's great to see her testimony and living for the Lord and, and witnessing for him but then we've also had we've got two more guys who are in in standby uh, since we haven't been able to have uh, in uh, in-person services at this point uh, not been able to baptize we've got two guys uh, one is a teenager uh, about 16 years of age and then another young man in his early 20s and so we hope in the near future to be able to baptize a couple of more uh, now one of the things uh, with our with the crisis the, sp the pandemic there in the country Spain uh, was some really hard days especially in the spring uh, with the outbreak and uh, Spain they had the, some of the strictest restrictions in all of Europe uh, and we were not able to get out at all um, I'll mention a little bit more about that later in the message but um, we've had some, a nursing home ministry uh, at one of the nursing homes we've been uh, going like twice a month uh, for three years we've been doing that of course when COVID hit that had to stop uh, because there's no visitors and everything like that so um, but another thing that we've done uh, has been uh, going Christmas caroling. We do that uh, each year at Christmas time. We'll usually pick, uh, go to about four or five different nursing homes and sing Christmas carols, and it's been a great opportunity for us. Uh, we, we'll usually have about 16, 18 people from our church that'll go between kids and adults and everybody, and uh, it's it's been an encouraging time. Well. We went to one nursing home for the first time this past Christmas and uh, sang Christmas carols. And uh, this is a place that we're actually uh, looking to, uh, the, in the town where this nursing home is, we're looking to plant a new church there in the very near future. Uh, so uh, this is a, a, a way that we're beginning to have some more contact with some of the people in the town. Uh, but when the when the pandemic hit, we contacted these nursing homes that we have regular contact with, and we asked if there was anything that we could do to help them. <clears throat> and so uh, some of them, we just sent some video messages, uh, trying to just encourage the residents there in, and the workers. And then uh, another nursing home, this other nursing home that I mentioned in the new town, um, they were actually, they needed a certain supplies, and so we, we bought some supplies, had them shipped directly to them. Uh, and they had lost half of their residents to the virus. Uh, they went from 48 to 24. Um, and during that time also they had to throw away a lot of their supplies because of uh, contamination, uh, arts and crafts, and physical therapy kind of things. And so we contacted uh, the HANA Project, which is the humanitarian aid arm of, of international missions. And so we asked them if they had any funds available for a crisis uh, project like this and so they said yes and so we got five hundred dollars to, to purchase some of these items to, to give to this uh, nursing home and so uh, we were able to get those supplies over there and the director of the nursing home says uh, she said was very grateful for it but she said you know you guys are the only ones that have even contacted us to see how we're doing and uh, it was really sad but we're trying to be a light to these people and to the community surrounding. And uh, so this has been something that we've been doing the last few years. Uh, and then also we, in this new area, we're trying to plan a church. Um, we've begun some English conversation groups. And so when pandemic hit, we just went online and have been doing that. We took a break during the summertime and had just restarted again. Uh, but it's been great. And oftentimes they say, this is the highlight of our week uh, to be able to do this and have this kind of uh, conversation in English. Uh, so we're, although the pandemic has kind of put a break on some things uh, and plans, uh, we are continuing to press forward and we're still looking to plant a new church in this new area. Uh, we have new personnel that will be headed our way, uh, Sam and Lauren Riggs. Uh, they are currently raising their support and hope to get to Spain. Uh, this spring sometime, this next spring sometime. <clears throat> so we'll be praying for them. They'll be working with us and the Johnsons 
uh, and especially focusing on uh, this new church plant and the ministry, trying to um, build a church there and, and evangelize in that area. Um, pray also for our family because we're going to be going back to Spain. Our plan is to go back at the beginning of January and we're going to be leaving our daughter here at Welch College. <laughs> So I'm confident that she's going to do great. She's going to be fine. But mom and dad are sure going to miss her. And so we're her brother. Her brother is really going to miss her too. Um, but be praying with us about those, uh, those things. I want to uh, mention to you also a way that you can keep in contact with us to know about what you can pray about and be informed of the ministry that's going on. Here on the table there, uh, just as you come in the door, uh, there's a few uh, cards there that you can pick up. We have our prayer card. Uh, we'd like to encourage you to pick that up. And uh, you can put that somewhere so that you remember to pray for us. And then there's also uh, this other card uh, that you can fill out this information at the top with your name, address, email, that kind of thing. If you would like to receive uh, updates through email or print newsletter. We only do a print newsletter about two or three times a year. But the email we do a lot more frequently. So if you're interested in receiving that, fill that out and you can get that to us. Uh, there's also a section here. Uh, where you can commit to give on a regular basis um, to our account. So if you're interested in supporting and partnering with us in that way, you can also fill out that information. Now, if you're following online or if you are here and you just prefer to do it online, you can also go to the website, which is iminc.org, O-R-G, and then look for the tab that says Missionaries. When you go, look on there, then just look for our faces. It'll have our prayer card picture there. Just look on our faces, the Edgemans. Click on there, and then at the bottom of that, there's a section where you can fill out the information either for receiving updates or for financial gifts. So uh, feel free to do it that way if you prefer to. Uh, I'll, before I bring the, the message, I wanted to share a quick vid video with you that is a prayer for Spain. Let's see if it starts up right away or not. There we go. Lord, Spain needs you. Its streets flow with busy people who are completely unaware of your grace. Its fields come flowers and food, but those who plant and harvest don't know the love they can find through your word. Spain has more brothels and bars than any country in Europe, and leads in the consumption of cocaine and marijuana. It desperately lacks the values, purpose, and peace that only you can provide. Don't delay, Lord. Each day that passes, more and more people are deceived by a religion of guilt, processions, and rituals that have nothing to do with the redemption that Jesus proclaimed. Speak to them in cathedrals. Tell them that you are alive, and that the anguished images they venerate are not the real story. All creation celebrates your presence. From the Cantabrian coast to the Mediterranean Sea, from Extremadura to Catalonia, from the Canary Islands to the Balearics, you have made Spain rich in landscapes and scenery. Thank you, Father, for providing spaces to enjoy your creativity. Lord, we cry out to you in all of the languages and accents you've given Spain that you will bring peace to its minds and hearts. Lord, you have blessed Spain with internationally renowned poets and artists, scientists and athletes. We ask now that you bless them with an understanding of your message of hope. You've made it a world-class tourist destination bowls and tapas and excellent restaurants and hundreds of castles and palaces, 
yet so few people who live with a faith in Jesus Christ. Our prayer is for a rich harvest from all of the seeds faithfully planted for over a century by your workers. Let this be the time for Spain. We ask for faith to see what has yet to be seen in Spain. A sea of changed lives who have found in Christ the purpose and light they are looking for. We ask for a new chapter in the history of Spain. That your spirit will work and produce spiritual hunger in Spaniards. And that your church can more effectively communicate that it is only in Christ that our inner thirst is truly quenched. In the name of Jesus, Amen. This is our prayer for the country of Spain that they really would understand this message of hope and that they would uh, come to know Christ as their Savior. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me into the Gospel of Matthew. Be looking at uh, a few verses from chapter 10. Um, you know, nowadays there's a lot of uh, a lot of us who like to take selfies. I think kids especially. Um, my, my kids, teenagers, and uh, they're... Every once in a while, I look over at them and I and I see them like looking at their phone and like doing the peace sign and taking a selfie of themselves. And then I look at their picture. And I'm like, you only took a picture of like half of your face. What's the deal? I don't understand that. All right, it's evidently it's a thing. They have to do these like streaks and all this and send these pictures. All right. Well, but then when it comes time, we're out someplace. And dad wants to take a selfie of the family, you know, with this nice background and all. They're like, oh, dad. <laughs> well, I tell you. Well, then there's other people who they want to take this selfie. And it's almost like there's a competition or something to see how far will you go to take the perfect selfie. And they'll like get out on the ledge of this cliff and on the edge of a, of a t tall building and things like that. And... Yeah, you know, I tell you, you're not seeing me do that kind of thing. That's for sure. But it's it's like they're just trying to see how far you go, you can go to get that perfect selfie. Well, some of them have ended up injured, and even there's been loss of life because of these risky situations they put themselves in. Well, as we think about that question, how far will you go? I was uh, thinking about uh, taking that and applying it in a spiritual matter. How far will you go for Jesus Christ? And I believe that's the overarching question that we see addressed in this passage we're going to look at in Matthew chapter 10. We'll be looking at verses beginning in verse 32 and we'll go down to verse 39. Beginning in verse 32 we read, So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And who, whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So as we look at this, the first couple of verses there, verses 32 and 33, I, I think that we can see kind of a, uh, one aspect of this overarching question. How far are you willing to go for Jesus Christ? Well, are you willing to confess your faith publicly before men? That's the first question I think that we uh, need to ask ourselves. So we see here, uh, are we willing to confess our faith before our co-workers, before our neighbors, our friends, our classmates? Well, I know that there are some of us who are a more extrovert, and maybe we don't have as much difficulty, it appears anyway, speaking in front of people. And then there's other people who are more introvert and they're thinking oh no I don't know that I can do that what would I say I can't speak in front of people I just get so nervous 
Well, that is totally understandable. I know when there's all kinds of people and all different kinds of ways. But it kind of reminds me of a scene that we see a lot of times on some TV shows or maybe in some movies where there's this guy and this girl and they love each other, but the guy, he just has difficulty saying those three words. I love you. Well, finally, the, the girl, she, she gets frustrated and she lays down the ultimatum. All right, you tell me that you love me and you show me or I'm out of here. Well, of course, you know, then he says, I love you. And it's like, man, saying those words, like, it makes it real. It's like, how are you going to take those words back? Well, as we look at kind of a, uh, that same kind of scenario in a spiritual sense, I think that we also see that Baptism is kind of like that moment where we stand up and we say publicly, I love God and I'm committed to Him. And I think that as we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we begin to experience that change in our own lives, I really think that we're going to have to see some of that stuff coming out of our mouth as well. We see that there's a connection between faith in the heart, and confession with the mouth. As we look at Scriptures, we see we can see it very clearly in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So I really think that when we've experienced that transformation in our lives, at some point it's going to have to come out of our mouth as well. It's just a logical uh, conclusion that comes after our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, are we willing to confess our faith publicly before men? I think that probably we're going to have to push ourselves and make sure that we do. It will be a, a, an evidence of some of that faith that we have in Jesus Christ. But also, I, can, I think that we see in this passage another aspect of this. Are you willing to follow Him although it may create division? Now, we get to verse 34 and we see a phrase that at first sight, it just seems difficult to understand. How can we reconcile Jesus coming to, be, to bring a sword and not bringing peace? How can we reconcile that with other passages in Scripture that talk about Jesus as the Prince of Peace? And how He's come to, to give us peace, not as the world gives us peace, but a peace that's beyond our understanding. How can we reconcile those two things? Well, I think He gets to that in the following verses there. Uh, we can see that, you know, let's put out a, a, an instance here. A person who follows Jesus Christ as their Savior, but their, their family members in their family that are not believers. Well, oftentimes you'll see that that's going to kind of put them at odds on some things. Because as a believer, we have values and we have perspectives and priorities that people who don't know Christ as their Savior don't have. And it puts us at odds with a lot of things in, in those areas. Now, the, the mother that I showed you earlier and who was baptized and, and raised her hand up in the air and she come out of the water, uh, mentioned about her daughter who accepted Christ as her Savior and was instrumental in, in leading her as well in her uh, coming to faith. Well, she also has two sons. And her two sons are not believers. And ever since she has made this decision, ever since the mother and daughter uh, have made this decision, these guys have been giving them a really hard time. Uh, and they're just like <coughs> insulting them and, and just making life difficult. Well, unfortunately that happens because of that difference that there is in a person who knows Christ as their Savior. 
And I think that, you know, all of us can come to grips with the fact that, okay, yes, the pagans are going to persecute us as believers. I mean, Jesus says, He warns us that, you know, they hated me and they persecuted me. And if you follow after me, you know, the logical conclusion is they're going to persecute you as well. But, you know, when it's family, that makes it more difficult. Now, during this uh, strict quarantine that we've had in the country of Spain uh, for, well, from about May the 10th until the very, very end of May, or March the 10th, excuse me, March the 10th until the very end of May, we were under a, a very strict quarantine where we were not allowed to go outside of our homes unless it was to an extremely essential job or to go seek medical attention to go get groceries or to take out the trash or walk a dog. Now, uh, to get the groceries, walking a dog, taking out the trash, only one person could do that. You can't go out together doing that. And it had to be an adult. So, we, don't have, we live in the third, uh, well, an apartment on the third floor of our apartment building. We have no yard. So, I would go out, get the groceries, and take out the trash. We don't have a dog. Um, we just don't have a dog in our house, so uh, we didn't get to take advantage of that opportunity. But uh, I was the only one who left our apartment during those months. My wife and kids were in our apartment that whole time. Now we do have two little balconies that are not much. It's not much longer than the piano here. <laughs> Uh, and just just wide enough to put a little bitty table and we got the four the skinniest chairs that we could find and so I'm telling you we took advantage of that balcony to eat lunch uh, more times than we ever had of the years we've lived in that apartment but you know one thing that I think happened a lot not only where we were in Spain but I think probably worldwide as people were confined to their homes and movement was restricted uh, I think there are two things that happen with families. One, they really got on each other's nerves. <laughs> and we're just kind of like, I want to wring some people's necks. Or two, they just grew to, to love each other even more and the bond was just made even stronger. That was the case of our family. I'm, I'm very thankful for my family, my wife, and my kids. And uh, I feel like uh, this is a positive thing that has come out of the, uh, the pandemic is our family has grown closer together. And so, it, you know, I love my wife and my kids. But what Jesus is telling us in this passage here is that we have to love Him even more than wife, Husband, kids, parents, any of those relationships. We should love Him more. Are we willing to follow Him even when it creates division? But then lastly, are we willing to follow Him although it will undoubtedly mean death? We look at verses 38 and verses 39 we see that Jesus talks about another cost of following Him. Now, in New Testament times, the cross meant one thing. It meant death. Now, I know that there are some people, who, and you've probably heard people say this kind of thing as well, that uh, they have this affliction or this problem, and you know this is just the cross that they have to bear. Well, I really don't believe that that's what Scriptures teach. As I mentioned, in New Testament times, what did the cross mean? It meant death. Jesus died on the cross. The criminals at His side died on the cross. When Jesus is telling us to take up our cross, He's not talking about these little things that we feel like we have to bear for Christ. We have to die to self. We have to die to our ambitions, die to our plans, 
die to ourself and live for Him. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, very uh, popular, very well-known verse in Scripture, says that I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. He died on the cross so that we could have life. And now as we, as we are crucified with Him, as you know, in that baptism we have that, that imagery there of that death to sin and being raised to newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, we die to self, but we are raised to a new life. He gives us a new life. But you know, I think that we can see a lot of times in Scriptures also that Christianity a lot of times is like a paradox. You know, we have certain paradoxes uh, as we see in Scriptures, you know, the first shall be last, and you help me here. The last shall be first, right? And then we, we can also see, you know, that we're poor, but at the same time we're rich. That's another paradox. Right, we see a paradox here in verse 39. That those who lose their life for my sake shall find it. We lose our life for Him, and that's when we really find life. I'm convinced that every believer is going to have to address that question in their lives about dying to self. Are we willing to die to self and live for Him? Now, it might be that, you know, in our day and time, well, I mean, in history, we know that there are a lot of people who have lost their life for their faith. And nowadays, there are some in parts of the world that also have been imprisoned or have lost their life for because of their faith. Now, we haven't had to experience those kinds of challenges and difficulties here in the United States. But every believer has to deal with this question about dying to self to live for Him. Now, in conclusion, it may seem strange or difficult for us to imagine Jesus Christ holding a sword in His hand. But we need to realize that that sword represents the fact that He comes to cut all ties and bonds, whether it be family, occupation, politics, nationality, or any other thing that competes for the throne of our hearts. He wants and He deserves first place in our lives. Now, it's not easy. And it's, uh, following Jesus Christ is likely going to cost us some things. But we're going to gain so many more things through Jesus Christ as our Savior. Now, I think that a lot of times there are Christians maybe who approach life with kind of closed hand mentality. You know, they, they say that they're Christians, and, and, but they want to hold on to their things. Maybe their time, want to hold on to their ambitions, the things that they really want to do, or whatever it might be, our resources, we want to hold on to them. But I really think that what we need to do is live our Christian walk with an open hand mentality. As we live life with an open hand mentality, the things that we have are more available to God. We're like, God, you want this? Take it. It's yours. I'm yours. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go. I want you to use me as your instrument. <clears throat> and I believe that that is a life that we all need to pursue. A Christian walk with Him in that aspect. There's a, a quote from Gary Chapman, Chapman. Now maybe, probably many of you have read some of his books. Uh, the book that I'm going to refer to here is The Five Love, Love Languages. And uh, he, there's this quote that he talks about here. And he talks about it in, the rela in a relationship more with a man and a woman or maybe even parents and children. Uh, but mostly uh, in the relationship of the man and the, and the woman. 
But I want us to, as I, I mention this quote, as I share it, I want us to think about these words in the thinking, having in our mind the relationship between our love for God, between us and God. So he says, For love, we will climb mountains, cross seas, traverse desert sands, and endure untold hardships. Without love, mountains become unclimbable, seas uncrossable, deserts unbearable, and hardships are lot in life. You know, we've seen uh, there are things that we'll do. We'll go to great extremes and endure great things because we love somebody. What will we do that for Jesus Christ? How far will we go for Jesus Christ? Are we willing to confess our faith publicly before man? Even though it's difficult, and even though we feel like maybe we're not equipped, you know, I think all we need is to have faith in Jesus Christ. That's all we need to really be able to share our faith with others. We don't need to have a degree in Bible or theology or anything like that. Share what Jesus Christ has done in your life. Share with others what, what He means to you. Are we willing to follow Him even though it may create division? If we, maybe we're the only one in our family and it's going to put us at odds with our family, are we willing to follow Him Anyway, are we willing to follow Him even though it means dying to self? How far will you go for Jesus Christ? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we do thank You so much for Your love for us. We thank You that You died on the cross for our sins so that we might have uh, the opportunity to know You as our Savior and have eternal life. We thank You for the hope and the peace that You bring to our lives. And Lord, I just ask that You would challenge each of our, each of our hearts today. That we would ask, our question, ask ourselves this question about how far will we go for Jesus Christ. Maybe that just means being here where we, where we are and being a light to others. Maybe it means going somewhere else and here in the U.S. Or, or even in some other part of the world. Lord, I pray that You would challenge us that we would really seek to live for You wherever we are. Help us to be that light and that message of hope to other people. Lord, we ask that uh, we would be able to see many people come to know You as our Savior. Here in this community, but uh, as you know, we've been talking about Spain here today. We really ask that You would help us as Your church, the body of Christ, to labor together so that people in the country of Spain can have access to the Gospel so that they can come to know You as their Savior. Lord, we pray these things in Your name. Amen. Amen.